you know, it's funny about last tracks with Giant albums. Last tracks with Giant albums are are really significant events, I think. I mean, if you look at I Lost My Head closing out interview, I, what what more could you do? So I I just I do love River. And, and I, I think when you think also what would be the one giant track you'd want to play somebody to get them to understand what they're dealing with when they hear giant. And I think River is a good example, but it depends on who your person is. You could bring them Advent of Panard. You could bring them Raconteur Troubadour, mm -hmm. which I think is a, a deep cut that is sort of underrated. I, I love Raconteur Troubadour. Did Kerry do all that drumming stuff on that, or what are you, or what are you doing on Raconteur Troubadour? Uh, nothing. I'm out at the pub. <laughs> That's you're staying out of the way. <laughs> but what about um, uh, things like "Think of Me with Kindness" and uh, "Boys in the Band"? Were mm -hmm. those difficult to put down? Uh, yeah, well, I've already told you about Boys in the Band, how difficult yeah. that was, because, I mean, we were under-rehearsed. I mean, that's a that's a deep-end tune, that is. Yeah. It's the tune I, I told you, but I said, no, Raymond, go away. I do, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. I can't yeah. play that. <laughs> it's so funny because, uh, just to remind people, we John challenged people to... Uh, to find the mistake in in his playing on the track and we had a couple of winners and and it's really funny because the amount of recovery is way more a subject than the mistake that just like the boom boom it's like a fraction of a second and you're you're in it and that's that's a real take that's that's interesting and imp impressive in its own right because you left it there. It's almost like when, when you have a piece of, of Japanese clay pottery and, and it's perfectly symmetrical and then the, the creator will just have a little mark on it to show, you know, this is, I'm still human. Well, John Weathers was still human at that moment, but I think the recovery is, is more of what I'm interested in. It's just like, oh yeah, <laughs> I'm not stopping. No, I, no, you no. Know, I... You noticed it, but it's oh, like... Yeah. And everyone else was like, no, no, we're fine. Um, but yeah, it's um, it's quite it's knots again is 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 an impressive thing. Um, was knots already in the pipeline? Yeah, I think it was. Mm -hmm. Kerry had all these lovely ideas, you see, tucked away in a little drawer somewhere. Because he when he was at home, of course, you know. What would he be doing all day? Playing the piano. You know, so he'd, he'd have all these bits. And he and Ray would get together, you know, and they they talk about all these bits that he had and any bits that Ray had, maybe, and stuff like that. So he and Ray would, would, would be constantly together, uh, putting together the these bits of the jigsaw. You know, that's what Kerry was like. He, he'd write something 30 seconds long, <laughs> you know, and, and record it mm -hmm. and then take it to Ray and say, what do you think of this? And, and Ray would go, yeah, um, have you got anything else slightly like that? And Kerry would go, oh, um, I got this, you know, and that's the way it would be kind of put together. Anyway, talking about mistakes, here's another one. There's a, a, there's a, a cracking mistake in Advent of Panurge. So find that one. Okay, folks, it's on. I got it, I got it, I got it written here. Oh. oh, okay. Panurge mistake. There's a mistake in Advent of Panurge on Octopus. It's an easy one, that is. Oh, it's an easy one? Well, I'm embarrassed for not being able to name it right now, but uh, I'll work on it, sir. <laughs> that's a good. That's a real. That's a good one. This oh, I thought I, I thought I'd get a teaser ready for you. Oh, you got me. <laughs> you got us. You've got us. Um, and so 
when you go out and now you're 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 touring octopus right it's it's last time phil's going to be with the band yes how was phil to you as a musical figure in the band um jack of all trades great great voice and <laughs> wonderful um ability to write lyrics and ideas for lyrics he and he and derek used to uh, work together quite a lot but it, it was i mean it was philip who came up with the um you know the the rabelais thing and the the uh, the knots thing and all of that um very very well read very intelligent and at that time he he was the he was the leader of the band. So he he came up with the idea of octopus, you know, octo opus, that kind of thing. One song for each of the member of the band and one for the road crew and one for the whole band. I mean, that that's what the idea was. What's the one for you? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> We, I mean, we know the dog's life is the roadie, but but we don't. Uh, that's very interesting. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, that was the original idea. Yeah, River was for Gary because he liked to fish. Hmm. I think possibly cry for everyone with mine. <laughs> wow. Well, that cry for everything, man. I put that up against anything heavy from 1972 or beyond. You know, I, these are the kinds of things where I don't know how you feel about it, but now that Giant is being treated as repertoire and bands are covering these tunes and you see them on YouTube, that must be very heartening for you. But I mean, songs like Cry for Everyone require a kick ass singer. Well, De Derek was definitely that. There was no doubt about that. I mean, he he came from, you know, R and B and blues, uh, so he had a great voice. But um, Phil's voice was was more like Kerry's. Right, he's between, right? Yes, yeah, that really sweet. He could sing anything, Philip. He he had a great great voice. He's singing uh, "Dog's Life." I believe so, yeah. And he used to sing Funny Ways on stage and do a beautiful job of it. Oh, he was the first Funny Ways, right. Yeah. Yeah, right. Oh, wow. That's amazing. So I'm fascinated by that period of the band with Phil because obviously everyone really knows what Giant becomes, but... Mm -hmm. The beginnings of it where he's saying no we're not going to be simon dupree we're going on to this other form of music and derek's saying that reg elton john was also encouraging them yes you should do something more you more you're up for more yeah and the musicianship level when you think about it, you got a royal academy guy and then you have a musical family where the father, you know, is is a serious working musician and, and they're just all playing multiple instruments in that house. Yeah. And that those two things meet. Well, you need the right guitarist and you need the right drummer. Well, I got lucky. You got lucky. They got lucky. Oh, <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's only because uh, they saw me play with um, with uh, uh, Graham Bond. Uh, and don't forget that Mike Giles was the first choice. But he Is didn't that want to play. right? Yeah. Mike Giles had left Crimson, you see. I forgot that that happened in that order, yeah. Yeah, and they asked him and he said, no. Nah. Huh. So I, think if, I think it was Raymond who, who put me forward for the gig. Yeah, well, of course, one of the great rhythm sections of rock music ever is Weathers Shulman. I'll put it up there with Squire White. I'll put it up there with Glover and Pace. I'll put it up there with anything. And I'll tell you what. 
That's very kind of you. <laughs> that's no, John. That's no small I'm, thing. I'm blushing. You, you, you seriously. The two of you locked it down so hard, and Ray is such a smashing bass player and so underrated. So underrated. But the two of you together, what it was a team, you know? And I told, I, you know what? We just lost Alan White. Mm. And, and I had the very, very sweet moment of being able to tell him what Squire White meant to me mm. and understanding how to play with a bass player and what to do and what not to do and how to make it feel like something and how to be a really vital part of the band. That's the other thing. It's not support anymore in Prague. Everybody's in it. Well, yes, changed a lot when when Alan White joined. There's no two ways about that. They changed a lot. You know, he he was a rock drummer. He was heavy. Oh, you, oh, you bet. Um, in all the gigs that we ever did with him, which were quite a lot, we never spoke. I don't know. I don't know why. Uh, I never kind of approached him and he didn't approach me. So I left it there. Huh. Yeah. You know, usually with, with bands, when you're touring with one particular band, the drummers tend to get together. Yeah. But yeah. I spent a lot of time with Barry Mobalo. He was a lovely guy. Really? But yes. Well, John, uh, John was, was, Fairly good. You, you could have a chat with him, but the others, you, you wouldn't get a word out of them. Really. They'd just be wondering about them. Oh, that's so you'd strange. Be lucky, you'd be lucky to get a nod. Did you hang out with Bill Ward? Uh, yeah. I hung out with all of Sabbath. They were a great bunch of guys. Real well, real rock and roll. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they were they were hot to trot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they taught us how not to do it. <laughs> I don't think you could do that and giant. It's, it's one or the other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, when when it when it comes to you know being chemically challenged. So much that you can't play a gig. That's not the way I was brought up, or musically, or any any other way. You know, the, the show is has got to go on. Yes. And, you know, I didn't even have a drink until the show was a third. Our show was a third over. Sure. I just I wanted to get that under my belt, and then and then get some juice. Yeah. Well, I wanted to, to jump ahead to talk sure. about uh, the reissue of Civilian. Right. Which I know has been something that you've been waiting for because you weren't happy originally with the drum sound. I certainly was. You were happy? Oh, yeah. But you wanted a better drum sound for, for the reissue. Did you not? I've totally missed that. No, sir. Oh, okay. I always thought that Jeff Emmerich did a did a wonderful job. Um, I've listened to the reissue and they've been kind of tweaked. They have been tweaked. There's no two ways about that. They they do sound better. I think they they've been lifted in the in the mix. Good. Um, but the actual sound of them um, is the same. Yeah, I, I guess I'm projecting because I feel the drums were a little bit under. And and for that kind of music, which was the heaviest giant, mm -hmm. I mean, I was talking also with Derek about this, which is, you know, when that record comes out, it's up against Devo, Freedom of Choice, Blizzard of Oz comes out, B-52s are coming out, Gaucho, Steely Dan... Motorhead, Ace of Spades, Rush Drama, I mean, Rush Permanent Waves, Yes Drama, XTC Black Sea, Duke by Genesis, Kate Bush, Never Forever, Peter Gabriel Melt, Adam and the Ants, Wild Frontier, Cure <laughs> 16 Seconds, Police Zenyatta. And I'm looking at this and I'm going, 
That's how I want to think about this record because it's competitive with that in the context of the, what I just said. Context. Deal with, deal with Giant now at that point and you'll find that I, I would put it up against Duke. I would put it up against Drama. I would put it up against Permanent Waves. And, and I love that Giant goes out classy like that. I always had a great <clears throat> deal of faith in that album. Um, and you know what I'm like, less is more. Yeah. The guys come up with, with these songs, like number one, Inside Out. It, it, to me, that was wonderful. I can just lay back, get a great sound, play tempo and think about a drum break, you know, 10 bars before I want to play it because everything is so relaxed. And, you know, they, 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 they're great tunes. They're really great tunes. Great tunes. I, the I, I, girls coming in, is it? I, I want to talk to you to more to you more about Civilian, but we have a, a, a special interruption here from my associate producer and my son, Oh, oh yes. Hey, how are you doing? Hi, Mr. Weathers. Nice to see, nice to see you again. As nice to speak to you. Gosh. Listen, nice to I'm see. Do you remember speaking to him when he was very little? Yes, I do, sir. When you phoned me that time. Yeah. And and you said, "Would you speak to my son?" And I said, "Sure." And he was already <laughs> playing at four. Now he's 21 and he's gigging. Wow. Yep. Playing. And he's a handsome devil, isn't he? <laughs> you take after your old man. You're too kind. You're too it's, kind. it's not fair, you know. It's not fair. <laughs> I want to be him. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I took him to see Three Friends. So he is, and, and, and also we opened, Mahavishnu opened for Three Friends at the uh, Keswick in Philly. So he's heard giant music played live now. Mm -hmm. And he grew up with that music. So uh, is there anything you want to say to Mr. Weathers? I mean, there's a lot I could say, but uh, to make it, I guess, short and sweet, um, it that music has truly impacted my life. And uh, it's something that I will always revisit, something I will always think fondly of. And uh, yeah, just really that music and that composition and that world means a lot to me. That's all. <laughs> You know how to make an old man's day. <laughs> That's very kind of you, young man. And Thank I, you, sir. Thank I you. hope you have a, a life as great as mine. I tell you, stick with it. Music That's is it. the world. It's everything. I believe it's, that. It'll believe give that. you a great life. I believe that to be so. Thank you. I oh, mean. yeah, you bet. And with his looks, <laughs> <laughs> I'll be set. <laughs> He hits very hard, John. Does he? He hits hard. Oh, good. He breaks my cymbals. I've never broken a cymbal in my career. He breaks cymbals, this guy. Oh, I have. <laughs> I used to. I made the mistake of getting a um, Zildjian thin. Oh, my God. <laughs> Lasted three gigs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Exploded, man. Yeah. And, and my son, Elias, was the first person to show me that Funny Ways was being sampled in hip hop by MF Doom, and and he was aware Strange of ways. hip hop guys. Uh, Strange Ways. Yeah, Strange Ways, and, and was MF. Funny Doom. Ways, and um, yeah. what else? Uh, um, not Knots. Knots. Yeah. So stuff like that. I mean, it's it's uh, it it lives on, obviously. You know. Yeah, it's aren't we weird? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's lovely. Yeah. See, it takes a minute, and I told this to Derek, and, and I'll tell you guys, great art exists outside of time. It transcends time, mm -hmm. right? So we're not saying, boy, this, this Mozart music is pretty good for being over 200 years old. You know, we're not saying that. You mm -hmm. know, I'm, I'm saying it's the 50 years since Octopus. Well, it sounds just like it's happening. Like, you'd, you'd wish you could have a band like that right now. <laughs> yeah. Oh. You all could write stuff like that now. That's the 
that's the trick of it. But of course, we're in a different time. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's <clears throat> younger guys appreciating what we did is the same as us appreciating what the older guys did. I mean, I love swing, the mm -hmm. bands of the 40s and stuff like that. And uh, the Andrew sisters, wow, harmony, whoa, come on. And the band going like, whoa. <laughs> I mean, that stuff is great. You know, so so it, it follows on really, as long as the, the material is strong enough, it, it will keep going. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, a lot of uh, guys are trying to be more interesting with their writing and more interesting with their composition now too, which is nice, yeah. um, you know. Again, just you know, calling back to guys like you and 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 that kind of progressive writing and that kind of stuff. So it's 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 good to see that it still exists. That's all, you know. That's great. Yeah, well, it's there. There are always going to be good musicians, and to be a good musician, you've got to have good music to play. Mm -hmm. And we we've, we've been through a very sterile period, you know, with with the eighties and stuff. It's all like pop, 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 mm -hmm. and not a great deal of exciting new music being written. Uh, or if there has been, it's all been like tucked away. Uh, I know that uh, Fripp has been uh, busy all the way along, but his his stuff is real deep, you know, for me. You got to look for it. I, I, I don't know. I, I can't. It's a bit, it's over my head. Well, how did you feel about like uh, in the court of the Crimson King at the moment with Giles? Oh, uh, that was great. Uh, at the at the time, that was very accessible. You know, particularly that that track was, was very very accessible. It's got a good hook. Yeah, I mean, that's a great hook. That is, you know. Um, but what he what he's doing, I ju I just can't get a hold of it. I, we played with them in uh, Kansas City, Missouri, and I couldn't watch the show. Bruford was with them, and John Wetton and stuff. Beautiful band, but it was it was just too busy. And it was look at me, look at me, and oh, come on, guys! In that what? way, it's very Mahavishnu. They you have a violinist, and everybody's going for it really strong. I think they had a chip on their shoulder for Mahavishnu. I don't know if you ever thought of it that way. Well, we played with Mahavishnu, and I loved it. Really? This oh, is the Bell Forum in New York? Yeah. Yeah. I loved them. Watched the whole show. Oh, man, what a band. Beautiful. Um, now, that was a busy band, but it was creative, busy, and... It wasn't boring, busy, you know, and Chester, on, oh, he just killed me, slaughtered me. Oh, Cobham. Uh, Cobham, I mean, not Chester. Yeah. He slaughtered me. Did you see Weather Report with Chester? Uh, I Did we play? We played a gig with Weather Report. Yeah. That's for sure. But I, I um, we played with Zappa. And Chester was on drums. And he was a beautiful guy. He said, hey, man. Oh, that's a beautiful old kit, that. Where'd you get that? How old is that? That's yeah, of course. Right. Yeah, we've had Chester. Yeah, Chester. He's a sweet man. Yeah. Sweet man. But but again, I could listen to Chester all night. Mm -hmm. But there, there was something about that show in Kansas City and I, I with, with Crimson Eye, and I just couldn't watch it. Myself or Gary, we, we sat there and tried. We really, really tried. I know they're popular, and I know there's loads of people will go, what does he know? But it, it's, you like what you like. Oh, um, I know. And, and, and certainly you guys uh, had your own thing, and they had their own thing, and... I think Derek also told me that you guys were sort of in your bubble, that it was just like your world was your world and everyone else could do whatever they were doing. But it wasn't like you were particularly influenced by anything. You were influenced by the r people writing the music you were playing. Yeah, we were. We were in a bubble. 
yeah. that's a, a very good description because we went on and did what we did. And I mean, I don't know what the audience who were at that Kansas City show uh, came away thinking because we went on and we played our hearts out. It was a great show and we went down a storm. And then Crimson came on and it was so kind of, it was more than relaxed. It was kind of deceased. It was so <laughs> relaxed. It was all just a, a jumble of notes and there was no show going on. Wow. And I resented that in a way because there's a presentation that you need to do to, to kind of put a show on. And we always put a show on. Yeah. Using yeah. our vehicle. Yeah, they're definitely more uh, artists. Uh, yeah, you know, it's that's that's the way it is. But that's fair. They're still doing gigs and I'm not. So well, they, they've retired it now, I think. Oh, have they? Yeah. That's the official announcement at the moment. Uh huh. Yeah. But it, it was it, it was kind of the audience might as well have gone to a recording studio and sat around there and watched them, you know. Yeah, yeah. Robert with all his all his stuff and sitting down and sorry, I I, I want to give it some. I, I understand. That's that's fascinating. Yeah, because I never know what it's like on that scene between the bands. You know, I always I'm curious, like, OK, who is nice? Who hung out? Who didn't hang out? Uh, you know, who thought they were rock stars? Who was cool? You know, and I always think of the giant guys as being just like, you know, nose to the grindstone, just like, you know, we'll have a beer. But basically, like, we're here for the music. And for 10 years, it was that way. Yeah, but we'd like to party a little. Yeah. Uh, not, not a great deal. A few beers, mostly, you know, after the show. Mm -hmm. That was it. Not before, then. <laughs> oh, no, never. Never, ever. No, I'd be running around in circles, warming up, warming the body up. Yeah. Before going on. I was just telling your dad that uh, I wouldn't have a beer until but third the way through a show. Yeah, got it. You got and, it. And I and I needed sustenance and I needed liquid and needed well a bit of alcohol, you need. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> <laughs> but that's that cool. that's the way it is. I mean, uh, I think we were a totally different band to anybody else. I mean, a lot of the pro bands worse very very serious you know extremely serious and uh, crimson were one of those a very serious band very serious too too serious for me yeah yeah i think derek said that it was very much about trying to make it all fun and that you know keeping it fresh and and fun and surprise people and and make it a show yeah do you know we one time down in down in Texas, I think it was Houston. We we played a theater there, uh, and it was oh an old um, uh, review theater. You know those lovely old theaters, mm -hmm. and there were thirteen people in the audience. That that's the only tickets they sold. We could have actually refused to play, but we didn't. We just said, "Come on down in front." Of you. And we played our hearts out, one of the best gigs of the whole tour. And they loved it. They were beautiful, these 13, 14 people. And that that's the attitude. Yeah. Not, oh, there's only, oh, I'm not playing. You know, we, we played and everybody was up for it. That's great. John, I just want... Yeah, and let I want to continue talking about civilian, but I'm I'm curious about this thing we we brought up on break about giant being on these big shows with uh, larger stadium shows and how yeah. that went down for you guys. Well, it was all the the tall stuff, the the, the tall tours that we did. I mean, they were they were pretty big uh, 
pretty big stadiums. Uh, I mean, they did a 30, 30,000. Yeah. Like no problem at all. No problem whatsoever. And uh, don't forget that, you know, in the, um, in the, in the real big ones, uh, like San Diego and the Dodgers Stadium in, uh, in LA, Anaheim, um, yes, had the same problem as us, really, getting their show across. Okay, they had lasers and stuff like that, and they, they went on when it was dark, and, you know, they were top of the bill. Um, but we had... I could see right up in the nosebleed section, you know, there was, there was somebody with a huge gentle giant banner up there. And um, we were, we opened the show and everybody, we went out absolutely beautifully great. You know, I'd, I pitied Gary Wright going on after us because there he is playing like middle of the road pop. Dreamweaver. Uh, yeah, quite. <laughs> he was and in I but was he in Spooky Tooth? What band was he in? He, he was in Spooky Tooth, which yeah. is a great, great band of the sixties. Now, what? And speaking of these bills, though, what, do you remember Griffin? Uh, yeah, but not not very well. I I know there was sort of medieval kind of that kind of stuff. Yeah, I can tour Troubadour. Yeah, forty five minutes. <laughs> And was Frampton on any of those? Uh, no, no. We, we did a few shows with uh, with Frampton. Not that many, but of course he he. It was pop again, wasn't it? The, the live album, Frampton Comes Alive. That was that was a pop album, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. hmm. Well, the thing, let let me tell you about the thing with with Genesis, right? Okay. In, in England, Genesis and Gentle Giant were on a par as far as fans were concerned. We had the same fans, exactly the same fans, and we're both going along like this, both of us trying to break into the into the mainframe, you know, let, let, let's have it. And I think we resented it a little when they suddenly went trick of the tail. Is a you know a single nice sort of a, a hit tune, and all of a sudden they're up, and we're still still there. So there was a tiny bit of resentment. So maybe that's that's what it was. And again, the the show the show I went to was. was um, that we saw in Southampton at one time. Uh, and that was uh, after Gabriel had gone and Phil was doing all the vocals up front and Chester was was playing drums. And I, I didn't think it was a great show. And I, I was, come on, you know, show me what you can do. And I didn't think it was wonderful. The 77, if, 78? Uh, yeah, that would have been 70, 77, 78. Yeah. When he had kind of inflatable things popping up over the stage and was kicking a football around and I don't know. <laughs> um, I wasn't that impressed. And I wanted to be impressed. I wanted to see why they, you know, taken off. Mm. And then I suddenly realised that it was... You know, because they'd written, they were they were sort of leaning towards prog pop. Now right. there's a there's a long long journey right from uh, Los Endos to you know you can't hurry love. <laughs> you get what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So. And let's get let's get back to civilian. But let's yeah, but in the context of civilian, because you know, obviously, I I mentioned those other recordings that are going on in eighty, what the musical pop culture is like, what the rock pop, 
I mean, what what you guys did is such a still a giant record. It's a gentle giant record. It's got that beautiful carry piece shadows on the street. <laughs> Don't miss that one, folks. Because that's just pure giant. And then, uh, you know, there there are things on it that are as good as anything you guys did. Um, the 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 uh, inside out, inside out. Wow, what a powerful tune! It's a good tune. Have you seen the animation that Noah Shulman's done? I wanted to mention that. Very mm -hmm. cool animation by Noah Shulman. Super cool. And there's a lot of them. If you can find any Noah Shulman Gentle Giant videos, they're official and they're beautiful. Yeah, well, I've, I've seen all of them. I get notifications from Noah. No, I, I'm speaking to my audience. I know you've seen Oh, right. Them. Oh, I do beg your pardon. I, hi I highly recommend uh, going on YouTube. Find these Gentle Giant visualizations, if you will. Uh, they're quite cool and coming from Noah Shulman, who is the son of Derek. Yeah. Yes. Great. And uh, what are your favorite tracks on Civilian? My favorite tracks on Civilian, right. Um, number one would be number one. I just love the feel on that. Mm. That was such a pleasure to play the tempo of that. That is a dream tempo for a drummer, <laughs> isn't it? Yes, it's a good one. Boom, boom, ga, boom. I mean, it, it, it's there, it's, it's wide open, it's a, a blank canvas. And to just hold it back and just put a couple of fills in that matter, that really, really matter, and get the feel. Uh, that's what I love about it. And it's a great hook, you know, uh, a great hook and a, a great lick. Um, inside out, I like. Mm. Um, I, I, I really do like it all. It, there's, it, there's nothing I don't like about it. I was very happy that uh, they've included Heroes yes, because yes. I was always very sad that that wasn't on the original album, but that was uh, simply because of uh, time. Uh, in, the, in the days of vinyl, the shorter you could make the album, the, the more quality you had because the, the gap between the grooves yeah. were, that's why Zappa only made, you know, all the, upper, the, the albums he made were like 36, 38 minutes. That's why like he that. had to put out four albums a year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was sound quality. That, that is the reason we left Heroes. And I love Heroes. It's such a great song and it's such a complete part of the whole package, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, I, I think it fits really well. Uh, tagged on to the end there. Mm -hmm. uh, after uh, It's Not Imagination. Yes. Which has got the, oh, that guitar solo. It just It slaughters me every time. It's not imagination is a great rocker. I, I like Giant showing their muscle on this record, but it's still dynamic and it's still got weirdness and it's still got complexity and it's it has it all. It's and I find that the you know the word is is competitive. It's competitive with what's going on at that time. I mean, who knows what catches on? But still, I mean, listen to it in the context of of those records. You know. Uh, the fact that you know Devo's in there and and XTC is doing Black Sea. I mean, it's that would be a double bill to have seen XTC, Black Sea, and Gentle Giant Civilian. You know, sort of the old school and the new school meet, but with similar intentions. Hmm. It, it was just unfortunate that by that time, of course, the the record companies had lost interest totally. Yeah. In our band in particular, if that had been a hit, we were hoping that then the back catalog would come in. You know, people would start to have a look at the band back catalog um, and, and get a feel for the rest of it of what we were capable of. 
but of course it you know the the game was up then yes. it was it was all over you know everybody was getting into a closet um all the you know uh program harem they they just like disappeared overnight uh there was the no jobs yeah all of that i mean yes managed but they'd already had like a top 40 hit with a roundabout maybe yeah uh so they were in um genesis were in and they they were like getting more prog pop as yeah. it went on so uh i if i remember rightly king crimson suddenly disappeared oh they came back though with the 80s version so they had one too that was more talking heads meets xtc meets king crimson mm. so so they they sort of adapted in their way and 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 that stuff's cool too mm. um but it's it's interesting that giant i think it's a really good end cap for giant i think civilian shows that giant had the the goods in in this in that climate of music and taste notwithstanding it's it stands as a great record i love it it was always one of my favorites um a lot of it had to do with the sound mm -hmm. jeff emmerich producing uh, uh engineering rather tell me uh, about jeff emmerich on the project oh sweet guy really sweet guy i mean we didn't take up his time chatting about the beatles we just let him get on with it and the drum sound uh, oh, he was just an expert mm -hmm. and the thing is that we'd all go out for lunch and jeff would be there with cigarettes and coffee and just keep playing playing it through tweaking playing it through tweaking you know just working on it all the time all the time just and the sounds that he gets i mean the sound of gary's guitar on it's not imagination man oh man and that was in a storeroom that was with a marshall amp turned flat out and like half a dozen microphones all the way around the storeroom mm. and he's giving it loads oh lovely the tail end of that solo where he really goes up and that slur oh my god the hairs on the back of my neck always go mm. and inside out the same it's just ooh. yeah and and so it's worth mentioning jeff emmerich sonically this is a great document of him working with a great rock band well it's it, it was he was a pleasure to work with he was such a quiet, you know, unassuming guy. I used to pick him up every morning from his hotel and drive him to the uh, to the uh, studios. Um, we got on like a house on fire. He was he was wonderful. He was absolutely wonderful, and he'd never, you know, come out and tell you to do something. You know, can you tune that drum down, or can can you, you know, change the sound of the snare, or he, he would just do it you know if, if if a drum sounds bad you don't mess around with a drum you change the mic that's the kind of mentality he had he was wonderful to work with really sweet sweet guy and did a great job i think for us yes you know, for the twilight zone that we were in <laughs> <laughs> yes you were weren't you well, you know, it, was, it may have been the twilight zone and we may or may not have known it but we were still going to give it hell well i recently played you the music that i made with mike keneally mm -hmm. so much coming out of gentle giant yeah it, it did sound like that but inspired I, 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 I could see exactly what you were getting on about, going on about with the with the Mike Giles symbols. <laughs> <laughs> right, where, where, where Keneally asked me if I could play this part as if Michael Giles had been the drummer in Gentle Giant. <laughs> yeah. stage, stage direction 101 from a great master. Um, 
But yeah, it's it, that's that's the other thing, John, is that you know we've been so inspired by those records, and you know I could put on the face today, and I probably will, or I can put on No God's a Man, and I'll always wonder at it. I'll just just stand and look at it and say. How did they do that? How did they fold the voices upon one another that way? How did they make everything fit on cogs and cogs? And my audience, if you don't know this, the new Brad Meldow album by the pianist, the great American pianist Brad Meldow, themes from cogs and cogs, variations on themes from cogs and cogs on this piano record, this keyboard record by this great musician, Brad Meldow. Look for it. You'll want to hear it. Giant continues to pervade the landscape of music. You have 21 year olds like my boy Elias that, you know, worship this band, that, that show that the band lives on in different parts of popular culture now. The Black Panther movie has knots in it. You know, mm -hmm. all, all of these moments where Giant has gotten in there in the way that it probably should have, which is that we needed 30 years, we needed 40, 50 years to appreciate some of what that was. Mm -hmm. It happens. You guys were ahead of your time in some ways, but you were also of your time. Mm -hmm. and, and it also speaks to the time where you came up, where the showmans were exposed to jazz and classical and, and, and Kerry was a percussionist and a classical composer and a keyboardist and all of the elements of rock and classical and jazz come together and Blues, vocal arranging. Rock and uh, that, that's it. I think it, it was, it was a melting pot, Greg. It, it, it really was a melting pot of, of just styles and musical knowledge. I learned so much from them. And I believe that they learned a little bit off me too. You know, we, we were all kind of teaching each other and bouncing off each other all the time. Um, uh, challenging. That, that is what every album was challenging. Uh, and every album was a different entity. I mean, they're about to bring out um, Missing Peace. Now, I love Missing Peace. I think it's some great stuff on there. The memories of old days. Wow. Oh, it heavy, yeah. Oh. It's some, there's some really good stuff on there. And each album kind of represented a, another change. Now, a lot, a, a lot of the diehard fans don't like Missing Peace. They think that's where we started to go wrong. And yet, it was just a progression, don't you think? You know, it's a musical progression. We, you know, we balanced it up totally with um, Giant for a Day. We didn't know where we were. We were just lost in this maze going, what do we do? And we just did the first thing that came into our heads, uh, which was dumb. <laughs> I don't know what, we, what else we could have done. I. I think we were all running around like headless chickens looking for a way out of this maze. And we we didn't know what, what was happening. Uh, it was very down phase of, uh, of Giant. Do you, think, line, do you think I, coming to Los Angeles to make civilian change of scenery, uh, change of process was, was important to making civilian work? Very much so. I think that is why it sounds like it does. I, I think, I think that is why it is what it is, is because all of a sudden we're in uh, Los Angeles for uh, a couple of months, you know, rehearsing and it's a, a totally different atmosphere and, you know, beautiful weather, nothing to worry about, you know, we're, we're staying, uh, in a, in a, uh, we got a, uh, an apartment just off the strip and that, that kind of thing. Did you, you know, stay at the Oakwoods? Uh, no, we all rented apartments. Because uh, the Oakwoods are apartments where a lot of bands stayed when they were making records there. Really? Yeah. 
in what in West Hollywood, North Hollywood? Uh, the, this was right off the strip. It, yeah. it was kind of uh, all these chalet kind of things built around a pool. Mm -hmm. um, I I don't know. <laughs> well, John, b before I let you go, I I, okay. I wanted to talk to you about something that I hold near and dear, which is through my years of, of uh, coming to England and working with Derek Bailey and following the British scene, I've become quite enamored of British tea. Are you a tea man or a coffee man? Uh, um, I'm, uh, I love a cup of tea. Yes. Uh, but I'm mainly a decaf coffee man. Yes. Well, I, I can't, to... I can't, coffee does terrible things to my, to my stomach and... I understand. And as a matter of fact, about, oh, three months ago, um, my wife and I went out for breakfast and uh, there was a really great cappuccino. So we, we drank this cappuccino and the, the breakfast was taking a long time. So I said, oh, we'll have another couple of those. And she said, yeah. So we had a couple more cup. Man, I, I was buzzing. I felt really ill. I, mean, I was buzzing for about six hours with the uh, with the caffeine. But coffee is different than tea, right? Pardon? The the coffee is different than the feeling of having a good nice cup of tea. Oh, a, a nice cup of tea has got caffeine, but it hasn't got very very much caffeine. So my my listeners will find this fun. Maybe John will. But here's some of my British tea collection. I'm a Twinings man. Oh, Darjeeling. Very Darjeeling is if I want to go easy. If I want to go really hard and I only have the uh, the decaffeinated version, but Irish breakfast, mm. quite good in, in the caffeinated version, but the strongest mm -hmm. of the bunch. Then there's the extra bold English breakfast. <laughs> quite nice. And the one that I chose to drink today Oh, very nice. <laughs> For my friend, my my Welshman friend, John Mothers, <laughs> Prince of Wales. And it's a beautiful and it's a different kind of cup of tea, actually. It's not the same as English breakfast. It's not the same as Irish breakfast. Mm -hmm. it's, its own flavor. It's a lower caffeine content. And mm -hmm. I chose it because I like to have a cup of tea when my English mates are having their beer o'clock. <laughs> it's my morning time, so I'm having my tea. So this is for you, John Weathers. <laughs> because I think you are a Prince of Wales. And I think, in the words of Dave Stewart and Egg, you're all princes. Gentle giant for us, you are the pantheon. You are the guiding light. I hope that I'm not overdoing it because I mean it. You guys changed our lives. And I want to thank you for that because I wouldn't be the musician that I am today without your music. Well, it's a bit embarrassing hearing, you know, the, those kind of plaudits from such a, a great player. Uh, you know, I'm very familiar with uh, with your playing too. I, you know, made a point of watching it, and you know, you far outstripped me. You're miles ahead of me. I, I told you, I just got lucky, man. Well, John, I, I I'm I so appreciate hearing that and and thank you. I I do mean it and I know I speak for many musicians and especially now internationally with the internet, what Giant has meant and continues to mean to quality music, interesting music, individualism, doing your own thing. I mean, honestly, the musicianship aside, you guys showed us do it your own way. Do it your own way. Do your thing. Get in the bubble. Make it your thing. And so I thank you for that because that was a life lesson. Well, thank you very much. It, it's all you can do is do your best, isn't it? Yeah. That guy out there has paid money to see what you're doing. So the best thing you can do is give him his money's worth. Otherwise, you're not worth a shit. <laughs> Am I right or am I you are, wrong? You are correct, sir. Yes. And twelve hundred dollars for a front and center seat to see Sir Paul, I think, is a bit over the top. 
if Sir Paul is watching this. And I just heard Tears for Fears ticket prices and they they put fear into my tears. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I'm sorry. No. It's still five and a half bucks when uh, when we were playing. Oh, don't get us started on that. I Yeah. <laughs> the Central Park shows, which I know you guys played and my dad took me to, 150 for the balcony, three <laughs> for this floor. <laughs> I, I gotta mention this though you know mm -hmm. this um this abba avatar show that's in london no oh well abba have got like um oh they put together a show of uh avatars projections of themselves oh. as they used to be in the 70s right and they've got a purpose-built theater in uh the O2 arena uh they built it from scratch and it only holds 3000 people only 3000 people they got a 10 piece band live band and they re-recorded all the vocals and they got avatars of themselves the four people in the band right on the stage you, you mean can, uh holograms yeah, yeah. Only it's beyond holograms. Really? It's beyond holograms. It's it's on YouTube. But honestly, they charge £21, which is about $28 for the up the back. But it's still only a 3,000 seater and they've got big screens and stuff like that. Down the front, it's... Uh, 55 pounds so they're not ripping anybody off at all 55 pounds which is about uh, 70 70 dollars something like that it's hard to see it this issue as being disrespectful to the fans and gouging the fans who were the ones that put you in this position in the first place i'll just say that mm. yeah it is a bit yeah. of gouging, isn't it it's a bit of a thing. We talk about it. Uh, I would love to go see some bands that I just think, well, you've priced me out. Really? Oh, yeah. And I won't know, ask who they are. No, but you see it happen now more frequently and sort of, oh, this is the last chance to see them. Oh, this is the, they're, they're not going to perform anymore. Uh, and then, you know, you see the ticket price and for a family to go. No. Mm. So then becomes very elitist. And then the music was never elitist to me. It was, you know, the punters and all the people that were really, you know, the fans. Um, so kind of a sidebar there. But yeah, I, yeah, I often, sorry, to, sorry and, to digressed. And I, I'm happy to see that that live music is is coming back. And I'm happy to see that Gentle Giant is getting performed by groups like the Project with Jonathan mm -hmm. Mover playing three weeks in Sp two weeks in Spain and also some other giant coming apparently. They have the tools to do it. They have the vocals, they have it. So so that's gonna be great with Keneally on guitar and keyboards. What's what's the band called? Project. Project. Yes. And John John Johnny Movers on uh, on drums. And running it. Wow. Yeah. Well, if you see him, say hello from me. I sure will. He's a big fan and he wants me to give you his love. So uh, he, he, he's a great guy. Great guy. And giant aficionado and Prague aficionado knows it all and has this band, by the way, uh, look for them on YouTube. And John, if you haven't seen them, ah, uh, oh, nailing, I'm making it. nailing all of it. Beautiful band, beautiful arrangements. So I will just say on this note, we're going to say for now. Okay. John, Otherwise, we'd be here all night, all day for you. But and, oh my and, and stay with me after I sign off. But I, I do do want to thank you again from all the fans. Thank you for Gentle Giant. Thank you for John Weathers. And, and thank you for all the great music that we will cherish until we are no longer on the planet. Thank you. Okay. I hope, hope the audience hasn't gone to sleep. No, this audience is here for you, John, and, and they loved every minute of it. 
Thank you for listening, folks. I thank you always for caring about this the way we care about it. And we will have so much more in the future. We're getting coming up now on our second anniversary. So that's pretty good. We've got a, a lot of episodes planned. Thank you, everybody. Hit us on Patreon if you feel like it. And thank you. We'll see you next time. Thank you, John Weathers. Have a good weekend, folks. All right. Wait a minute. You're telling me you worked with Quincy Jones? Yes, sir. How? Did film school with him. Oh, which one? Uh, it's a film that you never have heard of. It started off as being called the the Toy Grabbers. Um, oh, it was it was real off the wall kind of stuff. Um, uh, well, who? Oh God. British film? No, an American, an American film. Um, uh, and it had uh, who was the, the the lady who played Catwoman? Um, Julie Newmar. Julie Newmar, correct. And Victor Bono was in it, and uh, the guy who did Walter Mitty was in it. Wait a uh, minute, I have to look this up. Uh, Julie. The little guy with glasses. Oh, the guy with glasses. Yeah, who did the uh, Walter Mitty. Oh, yeah. Okay. So her filmography, let's go through that. What year would this have been? Uh, 69. The, 69. Maltese, 69. the Maltese Bippy. No, they, they changed the name of it and put it out as, as something else. Uh, but it was originally called The Toy Grabbers. Okay. Uh how about i don't see where is she in this oh seduction of a nerd seduction of a nerd 1970 release also known as up your teddy bear yeah that was the, seduction of a nerd was the third title so tell me the circumstances Okay, so um, our record producer, uh, Lou Reisner, was a big friend with loads of uh, like big American stars uh, that we used to go and meet in his office. And uh, we had one time we had a residency in uh, the Playboy Club in London, and uh, Quincy was uh, visiting, and Lou brought him down to see the band in the uh, in the Playboy Club. And uh, Lou, told, Lou told me later that, uh, well, I shouldn't really tell you this, but um, Q walks in and go, wow, this is a great band. I want to marry that drummer. <laughs> yeah, for real. Yes. So yes. anyway, anyway, um, uh, a few weeks later, we, we get we get a call from Lou saying, oh, uh, Quincy wants to work with you. He's He's got a movie to do, and he wants you guys to do the soundtrack with him. So what we would do, uh, we were staying in a, in a hotel or in uh, West London, and he, he was actually doing the music then, finishing off the music for the Italian job. Yeah or had just finished it. So he was gonna do uh, this movie, but he was gonna do it as a favor for the producer. Okay, so what would happen was that we were recording, this is the Eyes of Blue. Eyes of Blue. Yeah. We were recording an album at the time in, uh, in uh, Chapel Studios in London. So what we would do is in the mornings, we would, go around to, uh, no, in the, the late afternoons, we would go around to Quincy's, he, he had an apartment, he had a house in fact, that he was renting, and he would show us what he'd written, the bits and pieces he'd written for the soundtrack, okay? Then the next morning, first thing, we would go into the studio and we'd rec we would record the music for the soundtrack. And then when that session finished, we would go and do a three hour session on our old album. And then back 
have a night's sleep, <laughs> then, or I don't know, we we squeezed we squeezed it in anyway. Uh, we we were round there for oh about a week, I think, learning all these little short pieces of of music, and I would be conducting the band if there were there were no um, uh, no drums in it. Uh, and if there were drums in it, I'd be conducting. This was in a, a like a film sound studio, where you get you get the you know the the cue coming across like this. Yes, and just the band. Were were, were there other musicians added? Just the band. And so, the, what's the instrumentation? Uh, was bass, keyboards, uh, guitar, drums, um, and the singer played harmonica and they did a lot of harmonica on it. It's it's quite hard to get hold of. I've got a, a copy of it, but I, I must, got the internet. I must find it. Seduction of a Nerd is called. It's a terrible, terrible film. Oh, I bet, but I definitely still need to see it and hear it. But we got we got an old cue uh, and we, we actually put out a single of The Beatles Yesterday and on the B side, we had a jam and we called it Q3 because <laughs> he just had a, a son and his father was called Quincy. He was called Quincy and his son was called Quincy. So th that was Q3 was his son. So as a tribute to him, we called the jam Q3. And he was a wonderful, 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 wonderful man. Uh, I, I loved him to bits. And I can just second that emotion because the time I spent with him for the Yale Oral History Project, I mean, he, he wanted to hang out. I mean, we, we I was there for nine hours yeah. and, and he was just so gracious and, and so fun and, and so positive and loving and and yeah, it's it's amazing what that quality can do in a in a music production situation, right? Oh yeah, he actually did the sleeve notes then for the album that we were bringing out. So Quincy's involved with Eyes of Blue. Yeah, <sighs> the sting in the tail. <laughs> we never got paid. <laughs> <laughs> A proper jazz gig there. <laughs> oh, you bet. The guy who produced the movie just ran out of money and we never got paid. <laughs> oh, my God. And I well, thought I knew everything Julie Newmar had done. I have to find that. <laughs> oh, it's it's such a... Oh. But that's uh, that time, too, where 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 wacky and offbeat was... was oh, yeah. It, right? Oh, it's wacky, all right. There's, there's no doubt about that. If you want to see Victor Buono in drag. <laughs> I do not. However. <laughs> you do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, it, it's a great plot. I mean, it, it's a rubbish movie, but. Uh, and ironically, they work together closely in Batman 66 with uh, Adam Ward. And, and uh, she, she is Catwoman. He is King Tut. Yeah. And he was he died young in his 40s. Sure. Yeah. Oh, we never got got to meet any of the cast. I mean, no. the film, filming was done. We were just doing the music with Q. But uh, it was a great experience. And he loved the band. He, he really liked the band. And what a what a wonderful, wonderful guy. And let's be fair, the Michael Jackson stuff, the sound is just off this planet. Let's and I'll. Fair. I'll take you another one. Uh, the arrangements for the Count Basie band with Sinatra. Mm -hmm. He was going to give us a copy of that each. And they didn't have enough in the record shop. Yeah. I grew up with that one through my dad. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then even the television music, Ironsides and, and some of the oh. uh, police shows. Yeah. Yeah. Quincy important so important and such a lovely person so but still with us in his in his late 80s yeah yeah wonderful 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 man i loved him to bits you'll never hear stories like this anywhere else folks on it's the broadcast and we've got john weathers meeting 
Quincy Jones. Well, you learn something every day, don't you, young man? Oh, when I come to the master, I learn something every time. <laughs> I'm not the master. Well, <laughs> I'll think of you that way for, for, for my purposes. But thank you, John. But there, there you've got an interesting story to tell somebody. And, you know, worlds collide. They do collide. And this is this is part of what we're doing here, too, is, is finding out when they do, why and how. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. So thank you for that story, John Weathers. Yeah, well, if ever you see Quincy again, say that Pugwash was asking after you. And he goes, oh, yeah, <laughs> I remember him. Yes, I will. I bet you. Okay. <laughs>